Hey, we're diving in into Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 7 through 11. It says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. I know I missed it. Yeah, open. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks to, for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven Give good things to those who ask him. It's a pretty common uh, passage of scripture that we love to quote, especially for prayer. And I love when we look at this in our modern culture, in our language, and the English language of this translation, our focus is a little bit different than what the writer of this passage meant. It's different than what Jesus was trying to portray to his audience 2,000 years ago. I don't know about you. I'm giving you a scenario. This didn't ever happen, but uh, I ain't going to make up a story, but I'm trying to give you a lens through this. And it would be like my wife was shouting from the other side of the house and said, Greg, you ain't taking the trash out right. I've been doing it right. I've been putting it in the right bin. I make sure, you know, the recycle goes with recycle, the trash goes with the trash, and the yard stuff goes in the yard bin. I've been doing it right. And we're getting a fight. And she's like, no, honey, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. I said, can you take out the trash right now? Because the garbage truck's about to run. See, that little one word that I miss, because I put the emphasis on right, and my heart was so easy to, to cling to offense, I twist what she was trying to portray to me, to say to me. And we can do that so easily with Scripture. And when in Matthew 7 that, you know, Jesus says, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. Well, in our translation, and especially the one translation that actually gets this right, I'm not, I love ESV and we're reading out of ESV, but the one that really gets it right is King James Version. And when we look at the original Greek of this, our, we think the emphasis is on finding, is on the door being open and receiving. But the emphasis is on asking, seeking, and knocking. Jesus is trying to portray those three things to us. It ain't, it ain't about what we can get. It ain't about what door can open up for us. It's not about us finding something that we've been looking for. But it's about us asking, seeking, and knocking. And even in so much more in our culture, Jesus to the original audience at this point is a little bit different than how we are today. His original audience, obviously, majority of them were probably Jews. And a lot of them were devout. A lot of them had said many, many prayers all of their life. They knew how to pray. And we see later on in Scripture, his disciples say, teach us to pray. So there's obviously the way that Jesus communicated and prayed to God. There was something different that his disciples had to, they wanted to ask this one question. They didn't ask him how to preach. They didn't ask him to how to work a crowd. They didn't ask him any other question. But the biggest question that they asked him was how teach us to pray. How do we pray? But all their life they've seen prayer happen. They've been taught to pray since they were young. And if we're honest, a lot of them probably said, if you look at Jewish history and the religion of Judaism is, a lot of them said very, very long prayers that they memorize. A lot longer prayers than a lot of us have probably ever said. So you would think they would know how to pray. But Jesus was trying to teach them something in this moment. And the opposite almost in our culture is this. As we wait to pray, we think we can, whatever's going on in our life, we got some obstacle that we're facing. We got some illness that we're facing. Whatever's standing in our way, we're like, I'm going to try to figure this out and overcome it myself. I think I can do it. I think I can do it alone. But the reality is, is that we can't do it alone. The reality is, is that we need God. But for whatever reason, we wait to the last moment that our backs are against the wall, that we start crying out to God for help. But God calls us to be consistent. 
My main idea today is this, is that prayer is our first response, not our last resort. And not only is it our first response, but it's our second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on and so on response. Because it's a constant communication and relationship to God. My question for you this morning is, if Jesus prayed and prayed often, how much should we pray? Man, uh, it should be every time we go to the grocery store before we leave our car, that we should be asking God for guidance, that we should pray into the Father. The most important relationship that we could ever have, we should have an open communication and prayer to Him. But a lot of times we're silent, then we wonder why God's silent should be costing in our life we should be tarrying day by day spending every morning every evening every afternoon every night in prayer to the father because it's that important so the first one he says is that he tells us to ask so what is he saying here he's saying to ask with confidence ask with confidence ask with confidence and the reason why we we can ask with confidence is because that now we can go boldly to the Father, not because of our title, not because of our position in a church, not because I'm not a celebrity Christian, but this guy's a celebrity Christian, whatever that's supposed to mean, but because you're a son and daughter of God, because you're a child of the Most High, that you can ask with confidence, not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done, right? Right? In the Old Testament, they had to be fearful in, to enter the Holy of Holies, but we can pursue his presence, presence with confidence because of what he has done. That we can ask with boldness and confidence. See, the central figure of our prayer is not us, but it's him because of what he's done. That I'm confident in this one thing, what he's done for me. That I've been granted access because of Jesus dying on a bloody cross and rising out of that grave. That I know that I can pray to the Father. That I have a great advocate on my behalf. That I have a great high priest in Jesus Christ. And in this, I can ask with confidence. That I can be boldly. For a lot of us that we're not boldly. Sometimes you, you can even come in. Maybe there's somebody that came in this morning and... You are hesitant to worship like you normally do because of something you did this week. Or you feel less than. See, the reality is you don't have to. You can come in this place. You don't have to strive in his presence, not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done. And you can boldly enter his presence. That's how great his grace and mercy is. His mercy renews of every morning. And with this, we can ask with confidence. It says to ask and it will be given to you. Then he tells us to seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. I think this part is to me is one of the most important part of the three is asking is it's important to understand who we are in Christ that we can ask with confidence but seeking. See a lot of us we come because prayer is our last resort is because we think we know the answers to our problem. And we're just asking God just to say yes to our answers instead of seeking him. See, we can seek with diligence. That we should seek with diligence consistently before the Father. That I, I, I so desire to see a generation that would tarry in the presence of God, that would tarry through the night and seek after God, to seek his will, not their will, but to seek his will, that it would be done. And they will seek with diligence. See, that when we start to seek Jesus, our perspective starts to change. We realize that the answers that we think that we need to our prayer ain't really the answers. That we sometimes wonder, we could be like, Paul, why is this thorn still in my side? God is, if you trust him, he's sovereign. And there's a purpose for that thorn being in his side. And Paul thought maybe that I just need relief from this. That he's just going to take it away. And that's maybe what you're thinking. That he just needs to take this problem away, this issue away, this illness away. That he just needs to open that door, open that relationship. 
But maybe that's not the answer. Because you're not the Alpha and the Omega. You can't see it all. He can. And we have to trust in Him. See, when we start to seek Him consistently, we're building up this relationship with Him. Then we start to trust Him in this. And when you start to build a relationship with anybody, especially God, you start to figure out their ways. And when you have a relationship with Him, you realize His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And then in that, in the pain, in the suffering, in the stuff that you can't understand, you just start to trust Him because He is a good Father. And you know that He is sovereign, that you know that He's true to His Word, and that whatever is going on in your life, that you're going to just trust His plan, but you're going to continue to seek Him with diligence. And the next thing that you know, the things that you thought that you needed answers to, the things that you've been seeking, that you've been trying to find, that you assume that you knew the answers. But when you start spending time with him, your perspective is changing. Instead of seeing things earthly, you start having a heaven mindset. And like what Jesus declared in, in Matthew 7, when he gave them a blueprint, the disciples a blueprint, a prayer, he says, on earth as it is in heaven, that my will be done. See, it's not about our will being done, but it's about God's will being done. And if I have to go through suffering, if I have to go through pain, if, I, if the answers that I think need answered don't get answered, and it looks a different way, you start to be okay with it because you've been in his presence. Let me ask you, how, when was the last time you lingered in his presence? When is the last time that you saw after his face? When is the last time that you tarried in prayer and sought after him? Some things don't come in an instant. It's, it's, it's the kingdom of heaven now, but it's even to come. There's a greater hope to come. Everything ain't in an instant, but we think in our prayer life that, well, I'm going to wait until the last moment, and when I pray this, it's just going to happen in a, like a genie in a bottle. Or I'm going to come with my prayer list. I'm going to come with my, my, my pre-planned chart of how I spend prayer. It's not like that. It's a relationship with the God of the universe who desperately wants to know us. Jesus said that the Father's in the secret place waiting for us. He wants us to seek his face, not just his ways or his hands. When we start to seek his face, man, things start to change. When we start to seek his face, that God shows up in our midst, in our situations, in our problems. And we come with this checklist expecting all the, these things happen to happen, but he's just asking us to seek him. He said in Matthew 6 that he already knows all, all, everything that you need, that, he, that he, he took care of the fields, he took care of the birds. He knows that you need clothing. He knows that you need food. He knows that you need shelter. But we don't even have to ask for that because he already knows. But what does he tell us? To seek first. His kingdom and His righteousness. He's telling us to seek Him first in everything that we do. To seek His face first. To be obedient to His commandments. To be obedient to, to whatever He says in those prayer moments. And that can be hard. Because we came with our own perspective, our own ideas, our own answers. And maybe He's saying, no, no, Greg, that's, that's not the answer. This is the answer. We'd be obedient to this. We would be obedient to this. Just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was seeking the Father, asking the cup to pass from him. That wasn't the answer. The answer was him laying down his life on a cross. We would be, obe we would be obedient to death. We would be obedient to whatever he's telling us to do. We would be obedient to his wisdom. As we start to learn his heart, and get his rhythm of his heart. We start to know his ways. We start to know his thoughts. And our heart starts to line up with his. And no longer those things that we thought we had to have. No longer those answers that we thought that were the right answer. Are needed in our life. Because you realize all you needed was him. He's the answer. Not what you've been looking for. Not what I've been looking for, 
He's the answer. He's been the thing that you've been seeking. He's been the thing that you've been asking for. He's been the one that's been knocking. He's the answer. Not, not, the, not our healing from our sickness or our deliverance. We don't find our joy. We don't find our comfort. We don't find our peace in any of that. We don't find our peace in us getting a breakthrough in our finances. We don't find our peace in this relationship going well and, and having restoration. All those things are fine and they're good. And he's a good father and he wants to take care of those. But our answer is not in that. Our peace is not in that. Our hope is not in that. Our joy is not. And if Kentucky football goes 12-0, and 0, bring me a lot of happiness. Bring me a lot of happiness. But our joy is not in those circumstances. And instead of seeking the Father, and He's the answer. He's the one that is our joy. He is the one that is our Prince of Peace. He is the one that is our Comforter. We're seeking other things first. My question to you, my question to myself, is what are you seeking other than the Father? See, when you start to go through things and things get tough, what are you running to? If I'm honest, there's been times where things get chaotic in my life and I get stressed out. I'd rather run to a video game. I'd rather run to ESPN. I'd rather run to shooting basketball instead of getting in the secret place and seeking the Father. So much of us would rather seek out counsel, and there ain't nothing wrong with counsel. But are you seeking the Father first? Are you seeking Jesus first? Some of us are seeking answers in a bottle that we're never going to find. Some of us are seeking answers in a boyfriend or a girlfriend that ain't going to bring you wholeness or healing. There's only one that can. And he is the answer. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And that is Jesus. So we have to seek him first, consistently, diligently, diligently seeking him in everything. And as we continue to seek him, hope starts to rise in us. Our perspective starts to rise in us. We start to trust him. We start to trust him. And what I love about asking and seeking is this, is asking gives us Access. It gives us proximity to Jesus. It gives us proximity to Jesus. And seeking gives us consistency. And in any relationship, if you want to build trust and you want to build a relationship, you need proximity. Excuse me, I just burped in the mic. Um, you need proximity and you need consistency to build trust and faith. You've been granted access to Jesus, every one of us. If you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have been granted access to his presence, that you don't have to fight for an open heaven, that you live under an open heaven. Consistency is up to you. Jesus is not running away. He's not hard to find. He didn't run off. He didn't stop speaking. He didn't stop moving. He didn't stop healing. He didn't stop delivering. He didn't stop saving. He's still easy to find. Where is he? In the secret place. He's been where he's always been, waiting for you. Consistency is on us. So if we start to build proximity and consistency in our life, it leads to faith and trust. That leads me to this. It leads us to knocking. It leads us to knocking. See, knocking, we're thinking, why does this mean? What is Scripture trying to imply here that knock and the door will be open? It ain't, a lot of us have a habit of like playing ding dong ditch with God and running away. It's just like a one tap. That's, that's what we think prayer is. It's just a, just a one tap thing. We just ask one time and run away hope our, our issues, our answers uh, manifest in front of us. That's all we have to do. No. See, what he's actually applying here is to ask and keep on asking. Seeking and to keep on seeking. And knocking until, and keep on knocking until that door is open. The problem is, is there's some doors that you might knock on and you continue to knock, but if you've not been seeking him, you don't realize that God doesn't want that door to open. 
So you have to seek him first. You have to seek him first. But when you get his heart and understand his way and his will, and it's his will be done, not your will be done, it's like, okay, let's knock on this door. Let's knock on this door. And it's not that you're impatient, but you're patiently waiting. You have an anticipation in you. You have, you're not thinking God doesn't understand or he doesn't know. You're not, you don't have lack of faith because you're knocking. You're, you don't, you're not testing God because you continue to knock. What you're doing is doing the same thing that you were when you first started to ask. You realize you can't do this on your own. You're humbling yourself. You're telling God, and I'm humbling myself, and I need you. I need you. Son of David, don't pass me by. And you continue to knock. You continue to tarry in his presence in prayer. Everything ain't always instant. Sometimes you got to wait, and you got to keep knocking and knocking and knocking. Could he do everything in an instant? It's a good question. Yeah, he does. He can it depends if it's his sovereign will or not. Uh, we see with the early church, the apostles, Jesus ascends to heaven and he tells them to wait, to tarry, and to pray for the Holy Spirit. Did it come in an instant? It didn't. They had to wait and wait and wait and tarry and pray and pray and pray before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not everything's always an instant. We see that Jesus even had to play, pray for a blind man more than once. The Son of God. Not everything's in an instant. How much do we have to pray if he had to pray more than once? How much do we have to continue to seek him if these apostles that we put on a pedestal, that they had some greater access and they don't? We have the same access to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus as the early church did. But we put them on the, this pedestal, and we think, hmm, everything must have been easy. No, it wasn't easy. They had to continue to seek and seek and seek. They had to continue to knock and knock and knock. How much more do we need to knock? How much more do we need to seek and ask God? And it's not that we're impatient, but it's because we're humbling ourselves before God. If I'm honest, there's times in my life that it's easy to forget, ain't it? You get so busy and caught up in everything that you can forget to pray. You can forget to seek him. But I pray that in this church, in this body, and then obviously as the youth minister, I pray in our young people that, that there will be this, this hunger in us to seek his face. I tell you that, honestly, I, I miss the days when I was younger, and seeing a congregation just tarry in God's presence, you couldn't push them out the door. You couldn't push them out the door because they just want to tarry in God's presence. They want to worship him and seek him, that God was mightily moving in their midst. And I ask God for forgiveness in this because if, if this makes any sense, because as you get, like when I was younger, it was very easy for me to tarry. Then as you get older... You start thinking that you're this professional Christian and that you can figure it out. Sometimes it's hard to come to the altar because it's like, well, if I come to the altar, everybody thinks I'm messed up. Well, let me tell you, we're all messed up. But because we have some title or we've been here forever, ever, we have gray on our hair, or in our beard, maybe your back hair, I don't know. That we can't come and ask for prayer. That we think, well, we just got to figure this out on our own. Or if, I, if I'm honest to you, uh, as a professional Christian, um, I think you get caught up in ministry and doing ministry instead of being a shepherd and being amongst your sheep. And I ask God for forgiveness that we don't just get caught up in all of this administrative stuff. But we get back to where God has called us to. That we get back to that tugging of our hearts. That I don't want to grow up, I don't want my son to grow up in a household where he don't see his dad tarrying in the presence of God. 
I want him to know what it's like to see his, his dad and his mom cry in the middle of the day, weeping and wailing before God. There was a guy in my life at my home church, he passed away a handful of years ago named Don. And I remember as a teenager, and, and every time my youth pastor would invite some of us to, like on a random day of the week, like a Wednesday, Thursday, come to the church before school, and we'd gather and do prayer and a devotion together. And Don was always there in the middle of the sanctuary, and you normally have a blanket around him, and you just hear this old gentleman just crying out to God, day and night, crying out, out to God, and listening to him. Help me develop my prayer. Help me develop my relationship with God and, and how to communicate and pray after God. Just listening to him to tarry, to weep before the altar. I long for a generation that seeks after God in that way. I long to see that in this place. I'm grateful that we're in a series about prayer. I'm grateful that we're in a 21 days of prayer. This is the second time of the year. I'm grateful for all of that, but... I want something afresh. I want God to move in that way. And when people walk in this place, they can't help but to just crumble at the presence of God. Because I believe His presence changes everything. I know I've seen it. And not everything happens, like I said, what we think it should look like. And I don't, there could be skeptics in this audience today. They don't think God moves in the supernatural anymore. I've seen God do it. I've seen people walk out of wheelchairs. I've seen a dead man rise. And I know he could do all that again. And if he don't, I trust him. I trust him. That he's still good enough. And we have to get into that place that it's about his seeking his face and his presence first. And I just, today, even in this moment, just ask God to forgive the church, the body of Christ. That he would call out, as we see, the people just like the sons of Eli who worked in the temple and were, to, were about ministry for all the wrong things and all the wrong vices, that God would call out those people in this church age. The people that are more concerned about building up a church and how many hundreds or thousands of people they can get to come to the church instead of being a shepherd to the flock that he's called them. More people who are concerned about being, in a, being in an executive of a mega church than they are about praying before God. And I'm grateful for being a church that honors prayer, that honors the presence of God. I ask God to do something in this generation where it ain't just about building big churches. And I got nothing against a big church. I hope one day that we're reaching thousands every weekend. Because as people. But let's get the first things first. That the individuals, the ones matter. Not the thousands. He matters. That his presence matters. Not, not some formula, not some structure. All that's fine and Danny and God can use it. But for, first and foremost, Jesus matters. He matters. And I ask God that he would start to build up a church that would seek him. That would keep on knocking on that door. That would keep on knocking on that door. I asked a group of people um, before, we came, before I came in here. Uh, to join me up on stage. If y'all can, real quick, uh, make your way up here. We see, uh, I think in Matthew chapter 9, a uh, famous story with the woman with the issue of the blood. She, she takes sight and sees Jesus in this immense crowd. If I can have y'all stand like in the middle, kind of huddle up around one another. In the midst of a crowd. And the crowd was shoulder to shoulder. And Jesus, he was working, working his way through this giant crowd, obviously much bigger than the handful up here. And as she was working her way, she was dealing with this issue of blood that she's been dealing with for 12 years. She was seeking help in every other place but the Messiah and couldn't find an answer. She spent all that she had and couldn't find an answer. And she lived in a time that she couldn't even go to a minister because she was considered unclean. 
And if she went to a rabbi, if she went to a priest, because she was unclean, she made them unclean. But I'm grateful that she was able to look in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus, and see his face, and knew he was the one, knew he was the Messiah. I'm grateful for this story, because despite her risking everything, she continued to seek the one. She continued to push. She continued to knock. She continued to move to the crowd. If she could just get one touch of him, one touch of the hem of the garment, the Bible says. She knew everything could change. She knew the healer was in their midst. And she was willing to risk it all. And you're wondering, why risk it all? Because if she was in that place and did not get healed, they would have stoned her to death. But despite that, because she looked upon the face of the one, she looked upon the face of Jesus and knew that's where her healing lied, that she knew that's where her answer lied. It didn't matter about everything else. It didn't matter about the people that stand in her way. It didn't matter about her situation that stand in the way, that she was going to seek out for the one, that she was going to continue to knock, that she was going to continue to knock, that she was going to continue to push through the crowd. If she could just give one touch, just one touch, just one touch. And she knew one moment with the king, she knew one moment with Jesus, one moment in his presence could change everything. Because she sought after him, she was able to trust in him that he was really the one, that he really was the good father. And I love that in Matthew 7, it ends with that he is a good father. If that earthly vessels know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more does our father in heaven give good gifts to us? I don't care if everybody else in the room is being getting answered prayers. I'm still going to go push. Sometimes it might not seem unfair that somebody else gets something instantaneous and I've still been fighting for my healing. Sometimes it doesn't seem fair that somebody just started a new business and it took off and my business isn't struggling. Sometimes it doesn't make sense that whatever I've been seeking has not been coming my way, but I'm going to continue to knock. Despite the obstacles, I'm going to continue to seek him. If nobody else is worshiping him, I'm going to continue to worship him. If nobody else is praising him, I'm going to continue to praise him. If nobody else is seeking after him, I'm going to continue to seek. Why? Because I have to continue to knock for my family. I have to continue to knock for my career. I have to continue to knock for my city, for my community, for my son, for your daughter. That you have to continue to knock for your sister, for your mother. That you have to continue to knock for your friend that's an unbeliever. That I'm going to stay in his presence knowing that he is the answer and not me. Knowing that he is the way and not me. That I'm going to push through anything that I have to push through. I'm going, even if my culture says I shouldn't pray, I'm going to still consistent seek after him, knowing that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only answer. If you will, if everybody will stand up. Every head bow, and every eye close. God, I thank you. Thank you. Holy Spirit, I ask you to start ministering to hearts. If there's anybody that doesn't know you, God, that you start to convict them. God, that you would open up their eyes to see you today, to trust you as their Lord and Savior. Maybe that's you today. You're not serving God. You're not living your life for Him. You've not made him Savior and Lord. But today you've been feeling that conviction. You've been feeling that pull and tug on your heart, knowing that you need to make things right with him. Luckily, the Bible says that all we have to do is ask and call on the name of God. That <laughs> we would be saved. And I believe that he's still saving lives today. 
is still changing lives today. It's not about what you've done. It's not about if you're good enough, because the answer is, is that you're not. You're not worthy. None of us are. And you can't do it on your own. That's the whole point of asking. At this moment, you're like, I'm tired of running. I'm, try- I'm tired of trying to figure this out on my own. I'm t- tired of trying to overcome my sins, my habits, my mistakes. But I need help. All you got to do is simply ask for the Savior, the Lord, to come into your life. So if that's you today, we're going to pray together to ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior. Dear Heavenly Father, today I receive you as Lord and Savior. I believe that you sent your Son to die on the cross and that three days later he rose from the grave. And I put my trust in his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. That I put my trust that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And God, I ask you to help me to to live my life in a way that's honorable to you. God, that you have become Lord and Savior of everything I do. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. If you say that today, you say that prayer today with faith, welcome to the family of God.